Now that we've set up our guides, we're ready to lay out our type, starting with the headline. To put type on a page, we're going to need to create a text box, so we'll use the type tool for that, which is right in the toolbar, or you can just type the letter T on your keyboard, which is the shortcut, and it's the easier way. Either way, click and drag to create a text box for your headline. If you draw your box so it sits right on top of your guides, you might not be able to see the edges, but you can put your cursor inside. If you'd like to resize that text box, go back to your selection tool to do that because the text tool only types and draws text boxes. Now let's type our headline. Now let's highlight and change the font. Up here in the control bar, you can see your options. I'm using Palatino Linotype Bold, but you can use what you would like that's legible. Just avoid generic fonts like Times Roman, things like that. Palatino does require an inexpensive license for commercial purposes, so I'm putting that link below in the description. And we're gonna make it 27 points. Now let's make our headline red by double-clicking the fill chip located at the bottom of the toolbar. Choose the color you want to use, or if you have the CMYK codes of the color that matches your branding, you can enter the numbers here since we're working in CMYK for print. Either way, click the button that says Add CMYK Swatch so you can save your color swatch for use later if you want. And we can find that swatch anytime by going to the swatch panel. Go to Window, Color, and swatches. And there's our swatch. We can even create a new swatch here or change an existing swatch to a spot color in the Pantone library by double clicking on the swatch, change the process color to spot, and change the color mode to a Pantone library color. But we'll leave this CMYK since it will require full color process printing. So now we'll need to do a little more to this headline to make it look like the example, but we'll do that later when we work with type. Now let's create the quote in the first column with a text box as we did the headline. By the way, let's use the same line breaks for the quote that we see here. We wouldn't want the word doctor to appear on the top line separated from the word weather spoon. That would be a little weird. So it's important to keep our keywords together in our headlines and display type like this. And we keep our lines balanced in length. We're going to set that to Franklin Gothic medium italic at 14 points. So Franklin Gothic is also a licensed font, but it's the same link. If you want to use fonts you don't have to pay for, then anything that comes with Adobe software is fair game. President Ronald Vaughn, we have a new text box for. And we're going to style that. And we do not use a hyphen in front of the name. A hyphen is too short. Instead, we need a long dash called an M dash. And to insert that, click your cursor in front of the name and go to type, insert special character, hyphens and dashes, and M dash. And boom, you have a long dash that way. So should we have a space after an M dash? Most of the time you do not use a space on either side of an M dash, except in AP style, which is associated press style in the case of newspapers, magazines, journalism. You need to ask your editor which style the publication uses. By the way, some people like to create hanging quotes, and those are the big quotes outside the margin, and that's mostly for headlines. So for example, if you had a quotation mark at the beginning of the headline, you might want it to hang outside your margin, 
In case you have to do this, you just highlight it, go to Type, Story, and click on Optical Margin Alignment. And then you can say how many points you want it to hang out. And it's a really quick and cool technique. You can even move your quote up and down using a baseline shift option up in the control bar. But we don't need to do that today. I'm just showing you that it's possible. Let's create our text boxes now for the other three columns using our type tool to click and drag. And oops, looks like one of my boxes just needs some adjustment there. So we can go to the selection tool and align them to the margins adjusting as needed. And I think we're ready to fill the first column with text. So select the first column and right mouse click anywhere in the first column and select fill with placeholder text. And you can see the box fill with fake text, which we call Greeking. And it's useful when you're laying out a page and you don't have the text yet, but we do have the text for this article in a Word document in a file. So we could import that whole Word document actually by going to File and Place, and the text would come in automatically, but I think copy and paste is more intuitive for people starting out. So go ahead and open your document, and we're just gonna copy and paste. We don't need the quote at the top, just highlight the rest of the body copy. And there we go. And copy or control C and paste or control V. Okay, so we have text in our first column. It doesn't flow into the second column yet though. Instead, it's hidden at the bottom of the text box. This is called Overset Text, and it's denoted by this red box icon in the lower right corner of the column. That little red box is useful, so take your selection tool and click on it. And now you're going to see your cursor looks as though it has text attached to it. And you're going to take that cursor into the second column and click and boom, the text flows in. Now there's another little red box at the bottom of the second column. We need that text to flow into the third column. So click on that box and once again, we're going to click and boom, our text flows in there. And we can see at the bottom of that column whether we have text overset or not. And it's okay if we do because we're going to fix all this text later. Now all the text flows from one text box to another, like water. By the way, text boxes are also called text frames, and these are now linked or threaded, which some people use that term. Watch what happens when you take the selection tool and make a box smaller. The text flows into another column. Just remember whenever you want to link your text boxes, you can purposefully overflow your text box and then click that little red icon to continue the text into the next. There are lots of ways to link and unlink text boxes and I've included a link to a more in-depth tutorial below. Now we're gonna try out some letting, tracking, kerning, and paragraph control. So one of the things we can use to change the amount of space our text takes up is to change the letting. Letting is the space between lines of type. So let's highlight our type and go to the letting icon, which shows an arrow going up and down between lines of type. So if we click up, we can increase the space between lines up and down and we can compress our text or expand it. So I'm gonna change it back to auto for now. 
But you can also change space between letters, which is called tracking. So go to the tracking icon, which shows the arrow going side to side under some letters, and click the up arrow there to see space between characters increase, and the down arrow to see them decrease. It's another great tool to help you fit type into spaces. But we also see this in logos and other type design where we want specific words spaced out in various increments, so it's a pretty cool tool. So if tracking changes the spaces between all our characters, this next tool called kerning changes the space between just two characters. Just place your cursor between two letters and go to the kerning icon. Click the down arrow repeatedly, and you'll see the space close between those two letters. Okay, let's set that back to default. So how is kerning useful? Well, take a look at your headline and the word Utampa. There's a space between the T and the A that's larger than the spaces between other letters. So when type is large, optical illusions appear between letters. So place your cursor between the T and the A, and then go to the kerning icon and click the down arrow to tighten the space between those two letters. Professionals usually like to create nice tight kerning between letters of a headline, so we're going to come back and do that a little, little later and use a shortcut. Now let's change the font in the body copy and the subheadings. Drag through all three paragraphs, and if you can't drag through all three at once, it means your columns are not linked. So that means you'll need to go back and follow those steps to link them. But let's just assume all of these are linked and we're going to change these to 11 points. I'll use the Palatino font to match the headline. And we'll make our subheading stand out with Franklin Gothic medium font. Now let's add paragraph indents. A designer really has two options. You can indent your paragraphs or you can have space between paragraphs. This example we're mimicking has paragraph indents, so let's create those. Maybe in the past you've used the tab key or the space key to indent. Ah, uh, not good because the tab key default creates way too big a space, which is a dead giveaway for beginners. And the space bar creates inconsistent indents. But most importantly, we need a way to change all our paragraph indents at once so that we can change them anytime the client wants them. We don't have Sandals Little Elves to change 20 pages of indents or 200 pages of indents. So highlight all three columns and go up to the indent paragraph icon in the control bar. If your control bar isn't long enough to include the paragraph controls, go to the paragraph panel to continue editing. Go to window, type in tables, and paragraph. Now we have all the icons on the panel, more than we have on the control bar. And usually that's what we do at the beginning of a job anyway. We can just slide it over into our sidebar so that we can click on it and use it any time. And whether you use the control bar or the paragraph panel, we can go to the insert paragraph indent option and click that up key a couple of times to see the paragraphs indent all at once. There is no set proper size of a paragraph indent. It really depends on the design and these are narrow columns. So let's make small indents. Now we're going to remove indents from the paragraphs that don't call for them. The first paragraph and article is not indented. So let's highlight that and click the down arrow on the paragraph indent options to remove it. And we just removed that. We're also going to remove the indentations from our subheadings and the first line under each subheading 
To do that, we just highlight both the subheading and the line under it and change the indent options. Back to our page, we need some space above each subheading to separate them from the previous section and a little bit of space below each subheading. So highlight the first subheading and in your paragraph panel, see the icon to add space above paragraph. Click the up arrow a couple of times and just add a little space after. See the icon to the right as well and click that up arrow to create a little space after the subheading. And we'll do the same procedure for the other subheadings. In fact, we'll skip ahead. Last but not least, let's add a drop cap to the first letter of the first line to draw the eye into the article. Select the first letter of the article, and we need our paragraph panel, and we'll find that drop cap button which shows a large letter dropping down into a paragraph. Click the up arrow four times, and that will drop the cap down four lines into the text. Notice that our drop cap is now a little too close to that second letter, so we can use our kerning to separate them a tad. Just put your cursor in between that drop cap and the second letter and go ahead and increase your kerning a little bit. Okay. And we're done with our basic type layout. We're gonna fix some things later, but for now it's time to bring in some images and learn about frame and shape tools.